Good morning, everybody. Today, we're going to be going over the top benefits of intermittent fasting plus tips on how you can actually speed up your results. So I'm really excited to go into this because we talk a lot about how to use intermittent fasting and we do talk about some of the benefits, but I really wanted to make sure we dove into the main study benefits of intermittent fasting and what's really going on in the body. So as you guys might know, today is day one of the spring intermittent fasting challenge. We are just starting off in week one. So we're really kicking off strong with talking about the benefits and tips to speed up your results with intermittent fasting. If you guys want to join, it's definitely not too late. So make sure you grab the details for how to join the spring intermittent fasting challenge. Join all of the AM peeps from all around the world um, with the link down description below. So we are using the 21 day intermittent fasting program, um, starting off with day one, but make sure if you guys haven't already go, go through the details, like in the beginning, we talked a lot about this in last week's live stream, but knowledge is power. And this program just dives so much into how to individualize your approach, how you can actually take what your goals are and what your like health and lifestyle and meal preferences are, and be able to apply that to what you need. So. If you guys want to join, details linked down description below. But let's dive straight into the top benefits of intermittent fasting. So these are all the various study benefits that have been found with intermittent fasting. And there's been like an explosion of research around intermittent fasting in the last like 10 years. It's amazing. So obviously the first one that most people look to when they first are looking to incorporate intermittent fasting is probably this benefit and it's the fat burning slash reduced insulin response. So as you guys know, or if you've been watching my channel for a while, when you guys are fasting at the insulin level, which is our storing hormone, just naturally dips down. Um, this is because we're not eating. So insulin is really only released in most circumstances when we're eating and especially when we're eating protein and um, carbohydrates, but specifically carbohydrates. So when we're not eating, when we have those periodic states of um, fasting, like we are with the intermittent fasting challenge, insulin can naturally dip down, which essentially turns on uh, lipolysis, which is literally just means like fat breakdown, fat burning. So it's one of the main benefits and one reason why people see reduced um, visceral adiposity, which is weight gain specifically around the belly um, or just overall body composition perks especially with some of the other benefits. So the other one is increased growth hormone. This is why oftentimes when intermittent fasting is done the right way, you not only see a increase in fat burning where you're losing body fat, but also increased muscle mass or maintenance of muscle mass. Um, this is because growth hormone, or one of the reasons why is, is, is because <laughs> growth hormone um, naturally starts to increase during our fasted state, which is really muscle protective, but growth hormone also helps to further stimulate fat burning. So it's kind of like a twofer. Uh, one that you also probably have heard about with the top benefits is the cellular cleanup. So this is also called autophagy. This is one of the uh, likely reasons why people experience increased energy levels or tend to increase or tend to experience increased energy levels with intermittent fasting is because of the cellular cleanup or autophagy. So essentially these cells are just getting rid of like the trash from inside the cells and it makes it more highly functioning. So there's a lot of longevity benefits associated with that, but one of the more immediate benefits people tend to notice with it is increased energy levels. Now there's some speculation on like where the increased energy levels are coming from with intermittent fasting. That's probably one of the big ones. The other is probably because people are becoming more metabolically flexible, which is where you have that reduced insulin response. So you're able to switch back and forth from a state of fat burning, which is a much more sustainable energy source without those energy crashes. So probably with the energy level increases that people tend to experience with intermittent fasting, it's from both of those combined or like some combination. Okay. The next one that maybe you haven't heard of before, um, this is actually uh, quite a few studies have been done on this, but um, intermittent fasting has been found to reduce oxidative stress and inflammation. This is something that I've heard just from my own clients. Obviously, I've not participated in any studies, but from my own clients one on one, people tend to notice that like they just feel better. They feel less achy. They feel obviously more energy levels. Um, less brain fog. And definitely if they have like issues with their joints, they tend to notice just improvement in those areas might be because of the fact that intermittent fasting has been found to reduce oxidative stress and inflammation. So it's another really important factor. Another really cool one for a top benefit with intermittent fasting is that it increases BDNF, which is brain derived neurotropic factor. This is kind of like our 
growth hormone for our brain. So it's really associated with a lot of positive benefits with the brain. Um, you can see on their learning and memory. In fact, there's some interesting research showing that low B BDNF is associated with depression and possibly anxiety. So I've shared in the past how um, I've had a really long history of anxiety. And I've noticed that when I switched over to intermittent fasting, although I did make other changes at the same time, so I can't really like fully parcel out what was the cause. Uh, but I did notice really great improvements in my overall general anxiety. And I do notice that when I'm eating more frequently, my anxiety levels tend to go up. Could be because of the types of foods you tend to eat when you're eating more often, or it could be because of this BDNF factor. Not really kind of hard to, again, parcel that out without doing like a specific study on it, but one really cool benefit that has been studied with intermittent fasting. Now, this last one that I personally have found so like, one of my favorite <laughs> benefits of intermittent fasting um, that not as many people talk about is the increased migrating motor complex. So MMC. So if you guys have been watching my channel for a while, this is like, you are very familiar <laughs> with the MMC. We talk a lot about the MMC, but if you haven't heard about it, or maybe you have heard me talk about it, but you weren't really sure what it was, the migrating motor complex is our internal gut cleaning process. It literally, like when it's turned on, it turns on a series of contractions um, within our small intestine, within our stomach to help get out left behind food and bacteria. It also will turn on secretions to help push that out as well. So it really helps essentially clean house in between meals. And it's only turned on when we're fasting. So especially if like, gut health is one of your main goals. You really want to focus on this migrating motor complex so you can naturally help to push out that left behind food and bacteria that can just cause a lot of the fermentation and bloating that can happen if it's left behind. Um, so there I go more into it in obviously the program, but there's different ways to stimulate this even further with intermittent fasting. Definitely a clean fast is going to be more ideal for the migrating motor complex making sure that you're living a less stressed lifestyle, having less caffeine also is important, but the fasting component is one of the most important factors when it comes to the migrating motor complex. Otherwise you just, it won't turn on. Like you can do all of these other things. You can improve your stress. You can, you can decrease your caffeine intake and get better sleep. All of that can help, but it doesn't even turn on unless we're fasted. So that is one of my favorite benefits because again, I've shared in the past my horrible history with bloating, like literally after every single meal, pretty much all the way through college. And I would say probably about 2015, literally after every single meal, I would have to lay down on my belly because it was just so like, I looked like I was about six months pregnant <laughs> um, when I would eat a meal because I would be so bloated and so descended. I don't get that anymore. And that is just one of my favorite benefits of intermittent fasting. Okay. So now let's dive into how you can actually take these results, especially from, let's say the body composition where you want to maybe burn um, body fat while maintaining muscle mass. Let's say that maybe for the next three weeks during the spring intermittent fasting challenge is one of your main goals. So I have three different tips on how you can actually help to accelerate that progress with intermittent fasting during this challenge. Um, which if you guys are just tuning in, I know we've had a lot of people just joining in right now, but this is the week one of the spring intermittent fasting challenge. We are following the 21 day intermittent fasting program with the meal by meal guidance, the workouts in there, so much information, so much community support in the Facebook group. We have over 17,000 members in there now, which is mind blowing. That's so many AM peeps. But if you guys want to join in today's week or day one, week one, so you can join in with the link down description below. Okay, now let's get into how you can actually accelerate your results. This one is really great because it's been studied and this is incorporating resistance training. Now, not only has this been studied to show that when you combine resistance training, and this can cover a broad spectrum of types of exercise, we'll get into that in a second, but when you combine resistance training with intermittent fasting, it really helps to protect your muscles from breaking down and really, really helps to double down on that fat burning perk. I talked about this in my last live stream and I've shared uh, Kristen's story in the past and she's been on my YouTube channel sharing her experience, but she had incorporated or she'd first done a couple rounds of the 21 day program without using the workouts that are included at the end. These guys are right, right here. Um, and she had first seen results and 
you know, had experienced weight loss, was really happy about it, but then had hit a plateau and wasn't quite sure what was going on. Then she had applied the resistance training that's included in the 21 day intermittent fasting program. And she immediately was able to break through a plateau, lose 15 more pounds. And I don't have the picture up. I should have brought that up. Um, but her body composition totally changed. So I've seen this with obviously clients with A and peeps, but there's also research showing how when you combine resistance training with intermittent fasting, it really helps to double down on those perks. You don't have to be like Arnold and be doing really intense like deadlifting or anything, but just some type of uh, tension on the muscles can really go a long way. Another perk is that um, resistance training also boosts BDNF. So it helps double down on that other perk of intermittent fasting as well. So some of the things that I recommend is starting off with body weight exercises. This is a really great place to begin if you haven't really incorporated any type of exercise in the past or if it's been a really long time. It can be a little difficult to start off right away with dumbbells, with free weights, um, just because it, your, your muscles aren't primed yet. They're not, they haven't gained that strength yet to incorporate the dumbbells and it could cause a little bit of DOMS, which is not fun, which is delayed onset muscle soreness. Um, so starting off with more body weight exercises, you can actually get a lot done. So I put on here push-ups, air squats, walking lunges, etc. cetera. Um, so ideally we would want to see up to five days per week of strength training, but really it depends or resistance training rather. This depends on how you split it up. So it could be like three days or five days. Those are the two breakdowns I usually recommend. Three days is if you're doing total body training on each day and you have a rest day in between. You don't want to do back-to-back -back muscle groups. Um, so if you're doing total body only, then you'll want to make sure you have a rest day in between so you're not overworking your body and you're getting the benefits of the workout. So if you're opting for just a total body day, like let's say if you're combining, like I have in my program, I combine or I separate out like lower body strength and upper body push um, types of workouts. So lower body, upper body and core. So if you're going to use like those workouts, you just combine those into one day for one total body day, and then it would be split over three days. If you're doing five days per week, then you want it split into body parts. So you're not overworking any one body part. So it'd be like upper body one day, lower body, core, upper body, lower body. It's a great, simple way to break up your workouts if you're going for five days per week. Um, so working up to about 20 to 30 minutes, you don't need to be at the gym for like an hour, two hours unnecessary, especially if you're walking as well throughout the day. Really, when it comes to resistance training, especially if you're getting up to that five days per week, 20 to 30 minutes is a good sweet spot, especially if you find that you're like actually pushing yourself a bit during those 20 to 30 minutes. So I put on here, obviously, you can use the 21 day intermittent fasting program workouts. And I have the pictures or I have the videos that um, with the digital version, you can just click on and you'll be able to use like a follow along where I'm working out with you or the pictures. Or if you have another program, that's totally fine too. But resistance training or um, strength training, some type of uh, weight bearing exercise where you're actually getting weight on your muscles is ideal to double down on your perks with intermittent fasting. So I put on here ideally fasted, but really if that doesn't work for you, like if you are absolutely not a morning person, you can't get a good workout in in the morning, then just pick a time that is going to consistently work for you. So if that's, you know, where you can take a lunch break in the middle of the day, I have a lot of clients who have great gyms at their offices, which I'm super jealous of. I never had that. <laughs> um, but if you have that opportunity to take a break during your lunch break and work out, then great. Whatever you're able to consistently do, then I would just recommend that. That way you can just get this in consistently versus like haphazardly whenever it works. Okay. So the next thing, and by the way, um, I will be answering questions at the end. So if you do have questions, make sure to put four question marks before and after your question in the chat so that I can make sure to find it at the end. So the next thing that is so important, <laughs> this is something that like my YouTube channel focuses so much on, and it's focusing on protein, fat, and fiber meals. You really can't see results with intermittent fasting if you're not doing this. If you are keeping the same type of diet that has you've been maintaining forever that hasn't gotten you the results that you want, just applying intermittent fasting is not going to get you anywhere. You have to also make sure that you're addressing your meals and making sure that your meals are supporting your intermittent fasting goals. So 
protein, fat, fiber. We talk so much about that on my channel. Obviously in my program, we talk a lot about that as well. But the reason why this combination is so great is because it's less insulin spiking and lower glycemic. So we already know that one of the main uh, body recomposition benefits, the fat loss benefits of intermittent fasting. One of the main um, ones of it is that it's less insulin spiking. You get those breaks, those temporary breaks from constantly spiking your insulin throughout the day. Uh, so on top of that, if we can also address your meals and make sure that those are also not going to cause skyrocketing blood, blood sugar levels and, and therefore skyrocketing insulin levels, you're able to kind of transition more easily from that fasted state into the fed and have that stable energy level, not have to snack throughout the eating window because you're satiated um, and not have this over hyping insulin response that's going to just counter a lot of the benefits that you just got from the fast itself. So like I put on here, really doubles down on the similar intermittent fasting perks, um, provides nutrients for body recomposition. So especially you can see I put on here protein first. Protein should be the number one thing that you're thinking about with your intermittent fast during the eating window, of course, because you don't want protein during the fasting portion. Otherwise, you wouldn't be fasting. Um, but protein helps to protect your muscles from breaking down, helps to maintain your metabolic rate. There's, it helps to reduce uh, hunger, helps to reduce snacking, like sugar cravings. So many people are so shocked by when they actually take my protein calculation, which I just shared that video. I have an older video, but I also just shared a recent video on Thursday, I think it was, for how to calculate your protein needs. Obviously, I also have it in the program as well. Um, so many people are always shocked. If you go through the comments, they're like, whoa, I had no idea how much protein I was actually supposed to be having. I was drastically under eating. This step alone paired with intermittent fasting can be such a game changer for body recomposition, for totally shifting your cravings, making your whole the whole process easier for you, because if you're not craving those highly processed, hyper palatable, refined sugar, refined flour foods, that's like three quarters of the battle or like 90 percent of the battle for most people. If you aren't hungry and if you aren't craving and if you aren't getting that sugar tooth, it's so much easier. It's I used to be the biggest sugar tooth person ever. Like, seriously, I know it's kind of shocking, but when you add in enough protein, it's game changing. <laughs> so make sure you focus on the protein, fat and fiber. Again, we talk, make sure you read through the beginning of this. We talk so much about that. The meals follow that protein, fat, fiber approach. Um, it is going to be less insulin spiking and lower glycemic, um, reduces hunger and cravings and really make sure that you know your protein needs because this is a game changer. The amount of protein I need is not the same that my husband needs. If he were to eat the same amount of protein I eat in a day or that I need, he would be hungry. He would lose muscle mass. He would not be a very happy camper. If I were to eat the amount he needed, I don't even think I physically could because <laughs> I would be so full. So know how much protein you need. Check out that video I posted on Thursday. Um, or you can just type in like how to calculate your protein needs on YouTube and my video pops right up. And obviously, if you have the 21 day intermittent fasting program, which is what we're following right now with the spring intermittent fasting challenge, the recipes follow that format. So you don't even have to think about it, which is the nice thing. All right. So the third thing to double down on your intermittent fasting perks is to walk 10,000 steps or more. This is not a magic number. <laughs> There's no like real research behind the 10,000 steps thing. Uh, there has been some recent research kind of looking around like the eight to 10,000 range and showing there's definitely better perks with that than less. But what studies are consistently finding is that more walking generally is better than less walking. We are not meant to be really sedentary. We're not meant to be really sitting all day and that can increase inflammation in the body, um, just causes us to not be able to flex our muscles as much. Even that those little steps throughout the day really helps to absorb excess sugar in the body because your muscles are flexing and moving, um, absorbing that excess glucose. It reduces the sedentary moments throughout the day. So if we can increase your walking level, depending on where you're at, if we can increase it even by a little bit, it can really go miles. Um, so I put on here, you know, ideally trying to get around 10,000 or more. I personally get around like 12 to 15,000, depending on the day. Um, but a good place to start is even just to look at what your average is. Like if you only get 4,000 steps per day, which that is actually the average three to 4,000 steps per day is the average amount of steps an American gets every day. If you can just get 2,000 more and you're getting 6,000 steps per day and you're doing that every single day, 
that really adds up. So even if you just start there, adding 2,000 extra steps per day to what your current baseline is, that can really help to obviously greatly reduce how sedentary you are throughout the day. Um, and you'll, you'll feel better. The energy levels, especially if you can get out walking first thing in the morning, it's amazing how much that increases your energy levels. Uh, but on top of that, so you can see I put increases fat oxidation. So walking does help to naturally burn fat as fuel because it's a lower heart rate activity, doubles down on those same intermittent fasting perks. But if you're somebody who suffers from like more stress or especially gut health concerns um, or anxiety levels, if you can take that walk outside to some type of natural environment, it doesn't have to be like you know, you're walking through a forest, although I do know some people who live close by the forest and that's feasible, but even if it's like a park, a garden, whatever's close by, that has actually been bound to reduce your stress hormone cortisol levels. Um, so like, for example, I have a park pretty close to where we live. So on my lunch break, I go and take my dog Sophie and we walk around that park. It really does do wonders for your stress levels. And when you can reduce your stress hormone cortisol, that has been tied to weight gain around the belly, high levels have rather. So high levels of the stress hormone cortisol are tied to weight gain around the belly. So if we can reduce that, we can help the body to burn more fat as fuel, plus higher cortisol levels directly can cause insulin resistance. So we double down again on helping to improve insulin sensitivity by walking and walking specifically outside. So a lot of benefits of walking. Um, and if you can, I have a ton of different videos of walking schedules of what I recommend. So if you type like Autumn Bates walking schedule on YouTube, you will find that because there are a couple different ways that you can do it and some that are going to be better um, and more efficient than others. But really any walking you can get in is going to be better than none. So aim for more, at least 2000 more than what you're currently getting. If you can get to like that 10,000 mark, great. If you can't walk outside, walk around your house. Like it, it's been raining in California for like three months straight, I feel like. And there's been a lot of me just like walking around my tiny 1200 square foot house. So if I can do it, you can do it. <laughs> um, all right. So that concludes the three ways to help um, boost your intermittent fasting results during the next three weeks with your intermittent fasting challenge. So if you guys do want to join the spring, the three week spring intermittent fasting challenge, which I believe today is actually day one of spring, thankfully. Um, but if you guys want to join the spring intermittent fasting challenge, we all start today. It's a really amazing, informative, just fantastic challenge to join because the community is so supportive and we have so many great meals like i love food this thing is packed with a lot of really simple delicious meals that follow that protein fat and fiber approach no boring bland like chicken and broccoli meals here which you know that, that can be good too but like it's these meals are better <laughs> So if you guys want to join in, um, just check out the link down description below. I'm going to go through and um, answer some questions right now. Let me scroll back up to the top to see if there's any up here. Augie oh, Len, hello. Emily, good morning from Texas. Wendy in Montana. Is it cold there? Probably a lot colder than it is here. <laughs> oh, awesome. Um, good morning from the West Coast. Looking forward to my first challenge with this program. Me too. Cheers. I normally have coffee, but water cheers. <laughs> wow. Vienna, Austria. Hi, Ella. Maria, good morning from Indiana. Lessa, good morning from Corona. And Brooklyn, New York. Okay. Great question. So, Joy. When I have smoothies, I only use your recipes. And while they taste great, I'm just always, I just always still feel hungry afterwards. Any thoughts? Blueberry hemp is my favorite. This is where knowing your protein amount is really important. So likely you probably have higher protein needs than what this smoothie recipe has. My smoothie recipes are usually around like 25, 20, 25 grams of complete protein um, within each smoothie. So if you find like, let's say your protein needs are 90 grams per day and we split the meals up into three meals then you'll want to add on an extra like half serving of protein about an extra 10 grams of protein to your smoothie so like for the blueberry hemp that would be like you could add an extra half cup of um, greek yogurt you could do an extra scoop of my zero sugar protein powder to help make sure that you're getting enough protein for your body's needs 
that is one area that's a really great tool to kind of modulate your hunger. If you, with any of the meals, regardless of if it's like a smoothie or one of the other meals, if you find that you are not satisfied, it's likely because it wasn't enough protein for you. And especially like, let's say if it's one of the meals that's not a smoothie, where it's kind of easy to know specifically how much protein you're getting, because it's like using protein powder or like a specific amount of Greek yogurt where, um, you know, you're like measuring out like a cup or something. Um, that way is a lot easier to know specifically how much you're getting. What a lot of people don't do is measure out their like chicken or beef. I don't want you to feel that you have to always measure these out, but measure those out a couple of times. This is obviously not related to smoothies, but for other meals, um, if you find that you're not satisfied, measure out your protein a couple of times, just so you know what that amount that you need looks like. So if you find that you need a third of a pound cooked of protein at each meal, then measure that out so you know what it looks like. Probably a lot more than what you're currently eating. So make sure uh, if you are hungry, address your protein first. If not, then you might need to increase your fat. Um, I forget which page it is that I go into that. I go into like adjusting it based on your satiety needs within the program. Can't find it right now, but maybe if I find it later, <laughs> then I'll put it in the chat. But make sure you go back to this page, um, protein sources, and understand like what how much protein is actually going to be in each of the types of proteins that you will be using and adjust it based on your needs. All right. <laughs> wow, so many people here. Good morning from Scotland and New Zealand. Awesome. Julie, excited to do the 21 day challenge. Me too. Good morning from Canada. Thank you, Autumn, for all the videos and for the challenge. Of course. Yes, Stephen, good morning from Yukon. Almost time to ditch the treadmill and get back outside. Yes, yeah, definitely. I mean, I saw that on Wednesday of this week is when the rain is supposed to officially stop and we finally have sun down here after like three months of constant rain. I'm excited about that too. <laughs> wow, good morning from Bulgaria. Excited to do the 21 days as well. Okay, Katie, is it okay to do treadmill or rowing plus the strength training? Yeah, so there are different types of exercises. The strength training, um, rowing is kind of almost more of like a higher intensity exercise depending on, really just depending on your pace. It can be more of like a steady state, um, but treadmill and rowing would be more like cardio or hit, and then strength training would be more of that strength training exercise. You want to make sure you have a balance of both the cardio component, whether that be walking, swimming, biking, whatever you choose, um, while still having the strength training as well. The strength training component is so important for maintaining muscle mass, so important for body recomposition, um, for helping to improve insulin sensitivity. You don't want to lose muscle mass. And if you're just doing the treadmill or just doing rowing or just doing cycling or swimming, whatever it might be, then you are likely going to either maintain or lose muscle mass. So you need to get that constant challenge from strength training as well. Um, so again, use whatever program you want, but I do have the 21 day, um, strength training program as well that I made to go along with the intermittent fasting program. I have the follow along pictures or the videos that are in there too. So you can check that out or whatever you want. <laughs> this is an interesting one. Ella, is it true that you can gain weight when sleeping too many hours? Heard that many times. This is like bringing me back to like, <laughs> I remember there was like a show on TV where they like, I'm never mind. I'm not even going to go into that because I can't remember the specific reference, but um, no, usually it's the opposite. So usually if you're sleeping too little hours, then that's where you can experience weight gain because it can cause more of the hormonal changes that cause you to crave sugary, starchy foods, cause insulin resistance. I've referenced one study quite a few times on sleep and obesity and how you see a lot of these hormonal changes that are associated with poor sleep and, um, and increased weight gain, especially around the belly. Now, one thing that might be a concern is like you're saying too many hours. I would be interested in why 
you're sleeping what might be considered too many hours? Is it because your body is under such a state of stress that you need to have that extra recovery time to sleep? And maybe it's not the sleep where you're getting that recovery, but it's that your body is under too much stress that it could be causing that same type of um, hormonal change where it's shifting the body into more of an insulin resistant state. That could be possible. Otherwise, if you're not, if you're just sleeping, if you like, if you exercise quite a bit, you do need to have more sleep because you need more recovery. Um, like when I was back, back in my day, when I was training for the like triathlons and marathons, I was exercising so much and I had to sleep a lot more. I was getting like consistently 10 hours of sleep a night because my body was just recovering from all those workouts. So typically like if you require more sleep, it's because you have more stress on the body. If it's from exercise that's well structured and you're getting the recovery from your meals, then that's fine. But if it's just from constant stress, like that low level stress, whether it be from emotional stress, uh, physical stress from driving too much, whatever it might be, um, from a poor diet, which also can cause stress on the body, that's something different. And that's where it's not the sleep that's the problem. It's what's causing you to need that much sleep to recover. That could be the problem. Hope that makes sense. Okay, Megan, what if you aren't hungry when you need to break your fast? This is a good question because this can be the like one interesting issue that people come across that um, maybe people don't expect, especially in the beginning where, you know, when you first start intermittent fasting and the fear, and it was my fear when I first started, is like, oh my gosh, like I'm going to be so hungry. <laughs> like I need to eat right away. And then you start to burn more fat as fuel and you just aren't as hungry because your body is burning fat as fuel. And so you're actually getting energy from your own body fat. And so you aren't as hungry as you would be if you're eating constantly throughout the day and just riding that blood sugar roller coaster. So if you let's if you are like stuffed still for whatever reason, when you go to break your fast, then obviously you might want to like hold off a little bit on that. But I would recommend trying to be consistent with your eating window because you don't want to under eat. You don't want to eat too little of especially protein. So if you find that you aren't particularly like super hungry when you go to break your fast, um, just know that's kind of, that's also kind of normal where you aren't supposed to feel like, like starved when you go to break your fast. You're supposed to feel like I'm not, I'm not like hungry, but I could eat. Um, that's a, a normal response because you have shifted over from using fat or uh, to using fat as fuel from more of that blood sugar roller coaster. So I would still recommend eating your meals and making sure you're getting enough. Don't want to decrease because then you could go into a muscle um, mass loss situation and that can cause, you know, increase insulin resistance, et cetera, down the line. Okay. Hi, I'm doing 16-8 fasting and taking a lot of vitamins. Do I have to take those during the eight hour in order to not break my fast? Uh, it depends on the vitamin. So I'm assuming like you mean literal vitamins, like like vitamin B, C, et cetera. <laughs> Most of those are perfectly fine to be taking during the fast as long as they aren't in like a gummy format, you know, like where you have to chew on them and where it has sugar in it. But if it's in just like a capsule and there's nothing else in there, it's just like the vitamins itself, then that's fine. Um, if we're talking about other supplements, so like, let's say, um, protein powder or collagen, um, those do have protein in it, obviously. And so that will break a fast. You want to keep that during your eating window. So good rule of thumb, just look at to see if the like supplement facts has any grams of sugar, any grams of protein, any grams of carbs. If it does, then you want to keep that during your eating window. If it doesn't, then it's probably okay during the fast. Although there are some types of supplements that you do want to take with food. So make sure you're also checking that. So you're actually getting the benefits of the supplements that you're taking. Okay. Another, a good MMC question. Okay. Stacy is asking, what can you drink between meals that doesn't impact MMC? Pretty much this <laughs> water and uh, ginger tea. So um, water, really anything that has any digested di digestion potential, well, I can't talk, um, will stop the MMC. So anything that's not electrolytes, water, or ginger will break the MMC or not break, but like kind of like break a fast, stop. It will stop the MMC. Uh, so even coffee I'm iffy on because even though it doesn't have like technically calories where it doesn't really need a digest digestion, uh, it does 
tend to cause increased cortisol for some people and increased cortisol can cause that slowing effect of the MMC. So you don't really get the same benefits. So if you're really looking to maximize the migrating motor complex, which is that gut cleaning process, then I would just stick with water electrolytes and ginger tea, pure ginger tea. I talked about that in a video, I think it was two weeks ago on how it really helps to stimulate the migrating motor complex. That is one that's like the one food, but like really drink source that actually helps to speed up the migrating motor complex rather than slow it down. Yeah, Sherry, yes, upping my protein has been a game changer. Agreed. Uh, Katie, same thing. I was shocked at how much protein I needed. I wasn't even getting half. I've shared a, this one study so many times before um, on a few different of my videos in last year's six week summer meal plan, like limited release program. Yeah, last year's, <laughs> right? Yeah, it was last year's. But it's a, I think it was estimated about 42 or 46% of older Americans aren't even hitting the bare minimum of 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. So that's like that standard of protein is so low. It's the USDA guideline, um, like food recommendations, you know, the food pyramid, <laughs> they recommend 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight just to prevent a nutrient deficiency with protein or protein deficiency rather. And about 42 or 46 percent of older Americans aren't even hitting that amount, let alone the double portion, like the 1.6 grams per kilogram body weight that most people actually need to be getting per day for longevity, for muscle mass, for overall health. So it is pretty shocking when you actually look at and take a deep dive into what your protein needs are and how much you're actually getting per day, because you're probably not even getting half. This is something that I see so many times with my clients when we actually take a look at what their protein needs are, what they're actually getting, they're lucky to be getting half because, you know, it's just so underemphasized. It's not, um, since it is so satiating, it's something that like, if you're eating a lot of, um, food while out or getting prepackaged food or whatever it might be, manufacturers don't tend to put that in because it is satiating. So it causes you to stop eating. It also tends to be one of the more expensive ingredients. So they put in less of it. Instead, they'll combine the fat and carbohydrates so that it causes that bliss point. So you want to eat more and more. So you're eating a lower protein diet, but eating higher amount of fats and carbs combined that are not actually satiating you and not helping you achieve your goals. So getting that adequate amount of protein is such a game changer. Like if you haven't done that calculation, type into YouTube how to calculate your protein needs. I'm pretty sure my video is the first one that pops up or I have like a worksheet in here that helps you to calculate your needs. You need to do that. Trust me, it's a game changer. Gracie, should the steps be done at once or broken up throughout the day? Um, I would recommend breaking up throughout the day. 10,000 steps is a long time to be um, walking out all at once. You'd be probably, I don't know, it's like an hour, hour and a half. Depends on how fast you're walking. Hour and a half to hour 45 minutes of walking straight. Um, I recommend trying to break up throughout the day so you don't get those sedentary moments where you're having long stretches where you're just sitting all day. That can really increase inflammation in the body and also just cause a lot of issues in terms of like your muscles tightening and and causing um, like hip pain or leg pain or back pain. So just to feel better, even if it's just getting up every hour and doing that 250 steps that like my Fitbit will tell me I need to do, uh, that does help by breaking up throughout the day. Um, I do, like I mentioned, I do have a video where I go a lot more into the recommended walking schedule. So if you type like Autumn Bates walking schedule on YouTube, that video will pop up so that you can get a better idea of like specifically how you should break up your steps ideally. Okay. Um, Jennifer, I work out strength training at 5.30 a.m. I break my fast at 10 a.m. Is this okay or do I need to eat within 30 minutes after exercise? You don't need to eat within 30 minutes after exercise. Uh, again, this is why I highly recommend reading through the program first before you dive into it because it covers all of this and more on like questions on exercise and timing with intermittent fasting for best results. The biggest thing that you just need to do is actually getting enough protein throughout the day for your body's needs. Um, that 
it's, it's really like the 24 hours after your workout that you need to be getting enough of the amino acids to recover from that workout. The one caveat is if you were like a very serious athlete and you were training multiple times throughout the day, um, doing two days, and you were really looking to increase the anabolic process of really increasing your muscle mass, that's a much different approach. But for general health, for maintaining your slightly increasing muscle mass, you don't need to be eating immediately after your workout. You just need to be making sure you're getting enough when you go to break your fast and throughout your eating window. Good morning from Austin, Texas. Hello. Good morning, skills many. Melanie, this is my first time joining the 21 day challenge. Is there a specific group to join? Yes. So I have all the details for how you can join, including like how you can join the Facebook group, um, link down the description below. So if you click the little, like, it's like a little arrow tab for the video, uh, to see the description of this video, it's the first link listed with the blog post on how to join the challenge. So if you guys want to join the challenge, it starts today and you can just find those details linked down in the description below. Okay, I'm injured right now and cannot walk. Any tips? It depends on the injury. So typically, um, I mean, again, highly depends on the injury. So I would first ask your PT to see what you're able to do. But swimming is a good option to get out there if it's like an indoor pool that you have. Typically, for a lot of injuries, you can still swim. Even if like, let's say, I mean, this wouldn't really impact your walking ability. But let's say you did have a broken arm. You can walk in the pool even. Um, but you should be able to walk in real life, even if you had a broken arm. But if you had like some type of even foot injury, typically swimming is usually fine. Swimming is a great way to, to get that movement in without having that load from the body on the joints. So ask your um, PT, see if it's a good choice for you. But swimming is a great option instead of walking during a time of some injuries, but it depends on the injury. Emily, are your protein powders relatively low in lactose? Greek yogurt doesn't seem to bother me, so I'm okay with low lactose products. Yeah, definitely if Greek yogurt doesn't bother you, then my protein powder won't because it's a whey protein isolate. So it's the lowest lactose option out of all the different whey proteins. That's why I chose it because a lot of people are lactose intolerant. Um, I personally can have some degree of lactose intolerance as well. So from a GI health perspective, I 100% only use um, whey protein isolate because it is the lowest lactose option. So if you guys want to test out my zero sugar protein powder, that's 100% um, whey protein isolate, only uses monk fruit, um, no erythritol. I know that's a big concern for a lot of people, but only uses monk fruit, no stevia, um, whey protein isolate. You can find it on my store at autumnlnutrition.com forward slash shop. So autumnnutrition.com forward slash shop. Julie. Can I do two meals a day and a longer fast as long as I get enough protein? Do I add more fiber, and uh, fats and fiber also? You probably won't be able to. <laughs> you probably won't be able to add more fiber and fats um, when you're also simultaneously splitting protein between those two meals. I would first just make sure you're actually splitting enough protein between those two meals and then adding in the fats and fiber to satiety. So you don't necessarily need to increase the fats and fiber, but definitely you need to make sure you're still getting adequate protein split between those two meals. So two meal a day is really like the maximum I would recommend. I never recommend one meal a day. There's I've rarely seen a positive long-term benefits with that because it is so hard to get all your nutrient needs in without completely destroying your gut. So two meals a day is like the, I guess, minimum, not maximum, the minimum amount that I would recommend. I usually recommend trying to get three meals per day just because I found uh, it's a lot easier to get all your nutrient needs in while, without destroying your gut <laughs> in the process. But if two meals a day works for you, as long as you're getting enough protein, fantastic. Carol, your opinion about lectins with nuts, cucumbers, tomatoes, peppers, etc. Also, are weight machines in gyms okay? Uh, first one first, weight machines in gyms. Yes, um, there's positives and negatives to it. So like the machines at gyms, the reason why people tend to like them is because they can be a little like safer because it's a controlled environment. It's also a good option for beginners. So if you want that, great. You just tend to have a lot more freedom with free weights on what you can do and the types of moves you can do. Um, and even scaling up or down on the weights. So I'd recommend if you're able to the free weights, but especially if you're just starting off, then the weighted like machines are a really great option too. 
Now with the lectin option or lectin topic, I actually have a video I'm coming out with, I think it's next week about this specifically in my thoughts on the carnivore diet, which have greatly changed from my last video about like three or four years ago. So stay tuned for that. Uh, I go more into this in that video, but a uh, long story short with lectins, it really just depends on your sensitivity. Not everyone is as sensitive to lectins as others, almost like lactose. Some people just can't tolerate lactose. Others are perfectly fine. So lectins tend to more greatly affect people who already have inflammatory conditions or like arthritis, for example, um, or some type of autoimmune condition where those people tend to have a lot of really severe reactions to lectins. I personally don't have any reactions to lectins or at least obviously ones that are not in great quantities. Like you don't want to be eating raw kidney beans that can be lethal. Um, but for just general amount of lectins you get from actual edible foods, it just depends on your own sensitivity level. So if you find that you don't have an issue with lectins with at least the amount that you're eating right now that are in various veggies um, or like chia seeds, then I wouldn't stress about it. But if you do have like an autoimmune condition, if you do have really severe gut issues that are not solving, uh, even with some of these other tools, then that might be an area to look into for reducing or removing. Karen in the Netherlands, hello. Uh, Cindy, I have a video on carb cycling and I do talk more about this. Um, just type autumn Bates carb cycling on YouTube and that one will come up. Uh, this is kind of a tricky question though, because it just kind of, there's so many floating variables. There's your own carbohydrate sensitivity. So like, for example, if you're type two diabetic, then carb cycling of any type just really doesn't make sense because the body just can't really tolerate carbs at that moment. If you're not carb sensitive and you're you're exercising, you're active, strategically using carbs, like again, I talk about that in the 21 day program with the AEM nutrient timing, um, strategically using certain lower glycemic carbs can be really useful for muscle recovery and for sleep. It just depends on the person. Just using this broad category of carb cycling doesn't work for everybody because everybody has different sensitivities to carbohydrates. And even that can change over time. Um, and even during certain situations, like if you get really poor sleep, for example, and the next day, um, you actually have increased insulin resistance, even from day to day, things can change. So just overall using that one approach for like one person doesn't make sense. It, it makes more sense to apply it depending on the, what your goals are and where your health is at that point. And definitely sticking to lower glycemic options, not super high glycemic options. So obviously the less refined options, I typically recommend more of like sweet potatoes, squash, um, uh, properly cooked beans or lentils, uh, chickpeas can be a good option too, but you do want to make sure that you're not having like the highly refined grains and pastas and et cetera, that a lot of people tend to think that is a good option when they are carb cycling or else I can just get you back into the same issues that a lot of people had in the first place. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the same one I answered earlier. This, this is the first time joining the 21 day challenge. Is there a group that I need to join? I think this is the same person. Um, but yes, if you guys want to join all the details for how to join the challenge is linked down description below. Make sure to just click that little like arrow icon and it's the first, um, link that's listed for you guys. Tracy, if you're counting calories, can you substitute PB2 for regular peanut butter? I'm assuming you probably haven't seen my video on counting calories. <laughs> um, I have not found counting calories to be effective. This addressing this first part, counting calories doesn't really address the hormonal aspect. It doesn't address how certain foods affect your body. So if you look at like PB2 versus peanut butter, PB2 takes out all of the fat or essentially all of the fat. So you're not getting the hormonal benefits of satiety with the fat that regular peanut butter could provide. So although let's say you can have equal amounts of caloric intake from a tablespoon of peanut butter versus however much of PB2, one's going to make you feel satisfied and prevent sugar cravings and one is not. This is one of the main reasons why I never recommend calorie counting. That and also the types of foods you eat totally changes how your body uses energy and how much energy it's even using. There's a really great insulin researcher. You guys might've heard of him, Ben Bickman. He talks quite a bit about how even when um, you change from let, let, let's say eating a higher carbohydrate diet to somewhat lower carbohydrate diet, the body tends to just inherently 
burn an extra like two to 300 calories per day without changing anything else, purely just because of um, a lot of a lot of factors. But a lot of things happen when you change the like macronutrient distribution of your food, um, where that food's coming from, the protein, fat and fiber versus just strictly calorie counting. So in essence, if you want a lot more details on this, I go into insane amounts of research on this topic and why calorie counting is so not effective. Um, with the YouTube video, you can just type like Autumn Bates calorie counting on YouTube and it should pop right up. It's my more recent one from, I think a couple months ago, it goes so much into detail on that. I do not recommend calorie counting, especially as a long-term approach. Never found it to be effective, especially long-term. Maybe in the beginning, because it's a state of semi-starvation. Most people just lose weight in the beginning, but those hormonal changes in the body, they really adjust. And that's why most of the time people just completely plateau and start to gain weight again. Uh, okay, Brianna, I bought the bundle a week ago and I've been waking up in the middle of the night, 3 a.m. to drastic, to, to, are you asking if it's too drastic of a drop in carbs for my usual diet? Add carbs or push through until fat adapted. Thank you. There's a couple of different things that could be going on. It depends on um, what you're using within the program. Like, let's say if you had never exercised before and you're now exercising, but you're using the exercise too late in the evening, that could be causing you to wake up in the middle of the night. Um, from It's hard to say based on not knowing what you had before, but typically... Another thing that can happen, I mentioned this with like the increased energy levels with intermittent fasting. Some people notice that they do have increased energy with intermittent fasting and that can disturb their sleep in the beginning. So I would really address your sleep hygiene and make sure that you're using the strategies that I talk about, like no tech time, um, using magnesium if that's applicable, going on a 10 minute outside or outdoor walk uh, right before bed so that you can expose your eyes to darkness, reading before bed rather than looking at your phone. All those are really great tools to naturally increase your melatonin and help you to get that high quality deep sleep. I would address those first because that's typically what is causing some issues. All right, Alexandra, hello from Poland and I'm doing the challenge, awesome. Okay, I'm going to answer a couple more questions. Um, Cindy, I'm not a fan of chicken. Are your recipes good and not uh, require a lot of chicken? I've been watching you for last year, hoping to join this time. Yeah, so something that I made sure to do with my programs is to have it be really easy to swap in and out depending on your lifestyle and dietary needs. So if you're vegan, vegetarian, if you don't like chicken, if you only eat beef, if you don't eat beef, it's pretty easy to swap it in and out within my recipes so that you can choose whatever protein source that you prefer. So yes, if you don't if you don't like chicken, you don't need to eat chicken. <laughs> um, and you can find my program again, link down description below. Gerardo, is it okay to eat dark chocolate during an eating window? Yes, dark chocolate is one of the better dessert options. Um, I would just make sure that you're not like substituting that out for an actual meal and using that as a way to like get you to your next meal because we do need to make sure you're getting the protein component as well. Uh, one thing I will note as well, some people do struggle with sleep if they have, since we were just talking about sleep, if they have chocolate right before bed because it does naturally have some caffeine in it. So especially if you're caffeine sensitive, if you're going to have chocolate, I would not recommend it right before bed. All right, Kat, just finished your lower body strength workout. I'm definitely gonna feel it later, but it feels good. Looking forward to more. Awesome. Good job. That's, that's definitely a good one. <laughs> wow. Good morning from Morocco. Hello. June, thanks for your fun and informative videos. Can you please tell me the difference between using coconut water, coconut butter, and coconut cream? Yes. Coconut butter and coconut cream are pretty similar. They're both pretty much just like the fat source, just coconut cream tends to have like more liquid in it. That's why it's creamy. Coconut water if you were to break open the coconut, that's the literal water portion of it. So the coconut cream and butter comes from the meat portion. That's the fat. Coconut water comes from the water. It's pretty much just pure sugar and some electrolytes. <laughs> so it's it's a pretty sugary drink. Um, you know, using it as an occasional like dessert is one thing, but I wouldn't recommend having it like as the base to your smoothies because to use like 10 ounces, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but I think it's like 15 grams of sugar. For like 12 ounces of 
it's 16 grams sugar per 12 ounces. I can't remember specifically, but there's a significant portion of sugar in coconut water. Um, so again, using it as like an occasional thing, totally fine, but using it as like a daily, like nut milk substitute, especially if you're carb sensitive, probably isn't a good idea. Uh, is it okay to have peppermint tea during your fasted window? Yes. Peppermint tea, as long as there's nothing else in it, like honey or milk, cream, well, cream actually a little bit is fine if you're using the um, fasting mimicking approach. Again, dive into this for more details on fasting mimicking versus the clean fasting. But uh, yes, it is okay to have. Just don't add any sugar in there. Uh, the one caveat is it might disrupt the migrating motor complex. So if you're really looking to maximize on the gut healing aspects, then you might want to just stick with either ginger tea or water. Hello. So oh, almost like threw something off the table. Hello. So excited to start this challenge. If I'm considered to be overweight, but not obese, what should my protein needs? If you are considered, if you have a BMI below 30, then you still would use the between 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilogram. Um, if your BMI is over 30, then you will want to use more of your ideal body weight or goal weight. Uh, so if you want more details on how to calculate that, Again, I think it was on, what was it, Thursday's video that I share exactly, very simply how to calculate your protein needs. So make sure you check that out. If Okay, Christina, if I need 37 grams of protein a meal, do all 37 grams have to come from a complete protein? I would recommend it. I would recommend for best results, aiming for getting all of your protein needs from complete protein sources. So that you're actually going to get best benefits or best results. So if you are like, let's say getting 32 grams from your, com from your complete protein and the rest from uh, incomplete, then I wouldn't stress too much about that small difference. But, you know, if you're doing like half, like 15 grams um, or 18 grams from complete and the rest is from incomplete, you're not going to see the same benefits as you are from complete. So aiming for at least the vast majority of your proteins coming from complete sources will help yield much better results. Okay, guys. So this is... Week one of the spring intermittent fasting challenge. It is not too late to join. You can join the thousands of other a and peeps in the private Facebook group. We're using the complete or the 21 day intermittent fasting program with the recipes, the workouts, all the information. Um, so make sure you grab the details for how to join down description below. I will be doing another live stream next week as well as the following week. So each Monday of the live stream at 9 a.m. or of the each Monday of the challenge. I do live stream um, giving more tips and strategies for you guys to help support you throughout the uh, challenge. So make sure you join it next Monday at 9 a.m. PST. Uh, we'll be going over another topic then for how to support your goals throughout the challenge. But otherwise, thank you guys for tuning in. This is really fun. A lot of really good questions today. And